Hi, I'm Morris Gibb. I'm Barry Gibb. And I'm Robin Gibb, and we're the Bee Gees. tells me that it was about two years before I was back to normal again. Those two years I don't remember. So uh, whatever happened to me was blanked out completely. He never spoke till he was three years old because of all the pain he'd gone through, you know. And I think that when those things happen to you in life, what you gain from it is incredible inner strength. It did make him stronger, more determined. I think that's what really help to, you know, to make the pattern for his life. The Gibb family welcomed two more sons on December 22, 1949, when twins Robin and Morris were born. They were neither identical in appearance nor disposition. They've all, always had distinctive personalities. Morris was always very friendly, everybody's mate. Robin's always been a little bit withdrawn and into himself, but when they were together, they were the same. I was Mr. Goody Goody. Uh, I was I was so scared to do anything wrong. I'm basically a very shy person. I have to really know somebody before I reveal myself, uh, literally. Robin was a joyous kid. He, he was uh, hysterically funny. He'd always be in stitches, he'd always be laughing. This was the funniest kid you could ever meet. I like being Spontaneous. I like being funny with people. I like being relaxed, but you won't get that right away with me. Robin always had a twinkle in his eye, and of course I think Morris did too. Don't forget they're twins, you know. So there was a spe specific, special way that they would play off each other that only twins would know. When you're identical twins, a lot of people will wear the same clothes. Even later on in life, in the teenage years, Robin and I differ in, in the fact that we're fraternal twins and we're not identical, but we have the same sense of humor. We have the same love of the same kind of music. Being a twin, uh, I don't think it's so much having much to do with the Bee Gees. I think we would have been the Bee Gees if we had, even if we hadn't been twins. I never thought of me and Morris as separate from Barry. I always saw the three of us as three equal brothers. By 1955, Hugh's band had broken up. So in search of new opportunities, he moved the family back to Manchester. In the glory days of the empire, Manchester was the world's cotton capital, one of the great industrial centers. Now, it was a working class city in decline. So too were the Gibb family fortunes. To support Barbara and the four kids, 
Hugh held down two jobs. The house was always filled with music. The boys were influenced by the Mills brothers and the Everly brothers. And by the time Barry was nine and the twins were six, they were already singing in three-part harmony. There was quite a number of times when my parents and my sister would come in the room and wonder if the radio was on when we were doing that early stuff. At the age of seven, I remember very clearly seeing on television a song and dance man. And I remember it hitting me in the head that that's what I'd like to do. And I would just pretend to do that. And it was, I'm looking over a fully clover. So, <laughs> so I would do all this stuff and I'd pretend to be the song and dance man. The real love of it is when I heard Wake Up Little Susie by the Everly Brothers. And I kept on playing it over and over again. And I kept on hearing these harmonies. Robin and I seem to have evolved into two different leads. And Morris is an expert. Harmonist, is that the right word? But he would always know where to put that other melody. Make, make that to make a three-part harmony. I think it was about a year after we, we, we first started having fun that we realized it was what we wanted, wanted to do for the rest of our lives. But we weren't sitting down making plans. We were just kids having fun. The Bee Gees musical career actually began at the movies. One day before the feature, a boy got up on stage and mined to an Elvis Presley record. The brothers were inspired to try it themselves. We went to see the cinema manager and asked if we could get up on Saturday afternoon and do just what that boy had done, you know? And uh, he said, okay, he said, I can't pay you anything. We said, you get paid? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so we got the guitar and the records that we intended to mime to. And uh, on the way to the Gorman Theater, we were running and Morris dropped the records. In those days, they broke, folks. We were very disappointed that we'd lost our chance and, but we persuaded the managers to allow us to go on and sing anyway. And we just did what we did at home. And the kids loved it. And I, God, I remember that feeling. It was great. And we had our first real audience rush, you know. And, wow, this is what we want to do. We sit up all night talking about what, what we want to do in the future. When we grow, and we were talking about all the things we wanted to do. We wanted to make records. We wanted to write. And uh, we didn't know where we were going. But we used to sort of daydream and night dream. And uh, every other kind of dream. We just to talk about it day and night. Walking down the street in Manchester, I remember Barry saying that one day we're going to be really famous. And we said, oh, yeah, yeah. Whatever you say, he's the big brother, you know. <laughs> it was like a pact that we made in, in uh, Manchester that this is where we were going and nowhere else. Uh, that we were not going to detract from this pact. We were going to be famous come hell or high water. And after the hell in the high water. <laughs> As pint-sized rock and rollers, Barry, Robin, and Morris performed frequently at local theaters. To adults in the 1950s, rock and roll was synonymous with trouble. And so were the brothers Gibb. I am Robin of a town or something. Nothing stops in their way. Now when I think back, I feel really bad for my parents. Because if I'd have been my parents, I would have been pulling my hair out. And my father had little enough as it was. <laughs> Robin especially was very naughty. He used to light fires all over the place. Oh, yeah. You mean the flame? <laughs> he used to set hedges on fire. He'd light fires under the bed. Yeah, I was a bit of a fire bug when I was young. We lit a little fire in the field next to the house and it spread. And uh, it must have been in the middle of summer, but uh, it was, it spread all over the place. I went to look for them because it was getting them, you know, a bad time. And I walked through the town and I saw this fire engine and I thought, oh no, I knew, I knew it was behind it. <laughs> and they did a lot of damage. So we got to the top of the hill and, and, and um, there were all the billboards burning. It was a fantastic sight. And, um, and there was a policeman standing right next to us, and we had our co swimming costumes and our towels underneath our arms, you know. And we, we looked at the policeman, and he looked at us, and, and what, what happened, you know? And he said, you know, don't worry, we'll catch him. We'll catch him. And we sort of stood there, 
yes, we hope you do, officer, yes. Yeah. And, <laughs> but that was the end of it. The police did come one day and said, look, they did some reforms, but they said it could end up to a point where you would have to go to court and, uh, and be charged and be sent to the reform school if it got out of hand. I think actually it was the Manchester police that sort of encouraged my mother and father to go to Australia and even take them. <laughs> and he said, you know, maybe it's time you thought about emigrating because maybe these kids, they need more, they need space. <laughs> so, in 1958, with newborn baby Andy in tow, Hugh and Barbara decided the family needed to make a fresh start. I'd never heard of Australia, just strange words in Australia, absolutely strange when you're eight years old, seven or eight years old, it's an adventure. This is like, wow, I imagine like kangaroos going down the streets of Sydney and all these sort of adventurous places that we're going to go to, exotic, different, you know. Oh, amazing adventure. Because that, that was what was in our spirit. That that's why we were always getting into mischief. The idea of what's around the corner really was inside us. So the idea of going to Australia, we didn't even know what that was. But it sounds good. Let's try it. The Gibbs settled in Queensland, a state in northeast Australia known for its sunshine, beautiful beaches, and the Great Barrier Reef. Hugh took a job as a photographer. He bought an 8mm camera, and the brothers immediately began making home movies. I was filming them. <laughs> I was always the guy behind the camera, because I've always been the technical one. Uh, Barry and Robin, I wouldn't go as far as to say that their videotape, which players are still flashing 12, but it's... <laughs> He's gadget man, yeah. Um, it, whatever's new, um, Morris has bought yesterday. You know, it's that type of gadget ring, you know. But it, it, you, you could see it in those days. His fascination with cameras, his fascination with uh, 8mm filming. So, so in our very early home movies, the reason you see so much of Robin and me is because Morris is doing the filming. We film home movies of fights and things and people like hostage taking or, you know, people blowing up the tower, you know. We just come up with some bad stuff. The, the humour that we had is very, a very British sense of humour. And it really, yeah, it's really been and always has been strongly influenced by Peter Sellers, Spike Milliken and Harry Seeker. They made up The Goons, which was a BBC radio show when we were growing up. And it was totally left field. They would come out with lines like, uh, Right, men, are you ready? We leave at dawn tonight. You know, and it'd be very quick and very, very sort of weird sort of sense of humor. It was a very dry English sense of humor. And we got into that big time. We loved it. Now, it's always been there and they always make you laugh. Uh, they bounce off one another. It's just little things that can make it sound hilarious. In Australia, the brothers continued their quest for fame. To achieve that goal, they would sing just about anywhere. We always look for the best toilets in town. So we worked in some of the best toilets, let me tell you. <laughs> We'd go and sing in there because of the echo. And there was a great one I remember in, in Pitt Street, Sydney. It, no, it was in the park and it was a great echo. Really long and, and it was, we, we sang these harmonies, they sounded like records. The brothers took their act to a local speedway where they sang between races. The crowd showed their appreciation by throwing coins. Bill Gates, a local disc jockey, was impressed and persuaded Hugh and Barbara to let him promote the boys. As the initials BG were everywhere, Bill Gates, Barbara Gibb, Barry Gibb, Brothers Gibb, it was suggested that the trio be called the Bee Gees. Soon, the boys were heard regularly on Gates' radio show. In the summer of 1960, the Bee Gees got their next big break. The Bee Gees! Barry A, the leader of the group, come here. Barry Gibb and your, young, and your young brothers. Now, come on, who are you? Which is which? Your twins, eh? I'm Robin. Robin? And Morris. And Morris. Now, you're all sitting together, eh? That's right. And your brother, Barry, plays. Now, come on up. Come on up here. This was the first of what would be many TV appearances over the next few years. The Bee Gees played county fairs and clubs where they honed their craft as performers. With the act still in its formative stages, show business veteran Hugh became their manager. My father, bless him, but a 
has, has been unbelievable in our lives. He, he has been the main instigator of everything that we learned about the stage. Oh, my old man's a duckman, he wears a duckman's hat. He wears long, blimey trousers, and he gets in the council. Party. Even down to little things like when you go on and smile, because if you look like crap and you feel like crap, so will the audience. Smile, they'll smile with you. He taught us professionalism. I said, no, I ain't going to You're getting past your prime. And I was doing the clothes, which to make all the, the little waistcoats. And we cut an old pair of evening shoes up to make BG and gold leather on the little things, you know. Every time I think of moment, just vision of behind the ironing board, <laughs> mining the shirts. I've washed and ironed 42 shirts when they were going on tour. Barry wouldn't let me send anything to the lottery. I used to wash them and I didn't have a washing machine. Did them all by hand and then ironed all these shirts. So I worked, I worked hard. Now if you see a dustman, or look in old Wayland's stand, don't kick him in the dustbin, he might be my own dad. When we first started doing professional stuff, we were kind of like a child act doing the clubs in and around Sydney. You ever see that one at the beginning of Crocodile Dundee? <laughs> that we were places like that. So to give you an idea, it was very rough. Working men's clubs and these clubs and stuff, where they had slot machines and stuff, you had to have a kind of act that would be entertaining to them. But we always had to put humour into the act, you know. For years, actually, Robin was the comedian when in the club act, and I was the straight man, and Barry was the older brother. It was like a mixture of the Smothers Brothers, I guess. <laughs> a little bit of both. But uh, we did that because the mums and dads loved it. That's what you worked in front of. We didn't work in front of teenagers until we were teenagers. So Morris would have a tie that would go up, you know, and sort of a tie with an erection, if you, if you will. Or if you want. You know. um, but <laughs> but uh, he would do that during the show, and he would do it in the middle of a song, and it'd be fantastic, you know, because you'd be singing a dramatic song, and the tie would suddenly start to come up, you know. And I think the audience loved that stuff, you know, because it's the last thing they expect in the world. So, unexpected humour is the best. In 1963, their dream of becoming stars took a giant leap forward. They signed a record contract. What made the Bee Gees unique at this young age was that they weren't just singers. They also wrote songs, and their very first release was a Barry Gibb original. Kiss me once, oh yeah, baby. Kiss me twice, oh yeah, crazy. Kiss me three times, the three kisses of love, oh yeah. Morning, we released quite a few of our own songs and couldn't get a hit. We tried singing a couple of other people's songs, and we still didn't get a hit. So we thought, well, we'll just go back to singing our own songs because, you know, if we have flops, at least there are flops. Tell me that you really care. I run your fingers through my hair. Kiss me once, kiss me twice, and I'm in paradise. Kiss me once, oh yeah. We'd look at each other and say, we've just made that other step that we prayed that we might be able to do, you know. Just on our first television show, we just made our first record. Um, um, we still haven't had our first hit, but we we made the set. We we're on our way somewhere, you know. We we're always on our way somewhere. At this point, the brothers were supporting the family as professional entertainers, singing adult songs to adults. But their music and their ambitions were instantly transformed in 1964 when Australia, like the rest of the world, was invaded by the British. When the Beatles came to Sydney, the magic was unbelievable. I was mesmerized by them because they were doing something that we loved to do. And they were successful at it. I loved it because it was so... These were, this was a group and they were singing um, three-part harmony. And they were singing it like we did. The Bee Gees finally began denting the local charts in 1965 with self-penned songs like Wine and Women. Wine and Women, song will make me sad. Love and kisses and hearts will never have. We put out a record called Wine and Women, 
which was literally our first top 20 record. And we gave $200 to some childhood friends, a couple of young girls, and we told them, you know, go into Sydney and buy as many of uh, Wine and Women as you can buy. And the next week we were number 19 on the charts. So, oh, this is how it works, you know. <laughs> We've been buying our own records ever since, you know. We were doing television shows, but we were just regular TV acts. We weren't people having hit records, you know. And that was our dream. And at that point in time, our dream was being blocked. I was totally convinced that the right thing we had for us to do was to leave Australia. We knew if we were going to make it, being international, we had to leave Australia and go to London. Just before leaving the country, the Bee Gees recorded one last song, Spicks and Specks. Where is the sun that shone on my head? going to break through in England and that was that was a far bigger battle than we could have imagined. We just had blind faith. There was a feeling inside us that once people had heard us and, and knew what we were about they, they liked us. So they wanted to go home. So they couldn't really remember a lot about England but they wanted to go back. We didn't want to go, we never wanted to go back, but um, we, we had to go. So my husband sent tapes to um, Bran Epstein, he sent tapes to Harry Lewis and uh, Herbert Wilcox, people, London management, all these people, and um, left it at that. Oh, where are they? In January 1967, the entire Gibb family boarded a ship that would take them back home to England. While at sea, they received unexpected news. Well, we were on the Indian Ocean when uh, we heard Spicks and Specks had gone to number one, which was very exciting. Just blew us away. Um, we're a week out now, you know. And uh, we're thinking, oh, great. You know, the only people who knew were the rest of the Australians on board the ship, you know, going, hey, great, nice one, you got a number one. So, of course, then they landed in England with a, a number one record in Australia. Didn't mean a thing. Five weeks later, when the Bee Gees arrived in England, the music scene was still dominated by the Beatles, in whose wake had come the Rolling Stones, the Who, and many other successful groups. The Bee Gees were determined to be the next big thing. But their optimism was immediately challenged by a random encounter with another group. There were these four guys standing on the dock. It was night time and it was thick fog. And, the four, uh, and these four guys were dressed exactly as the Beatles were dressed in help. They, they said they were a group, a failed group, and said, groups are out, it's over. And they said, you know, go back, go back. And we'd go back, where? It took us five weeks to get here, you know. Once again, it's like the resilience thing. It didn't matter what came our way. It was, it was just another obstacle. Get out of the way, we're going to make it. We're going to be famous. Before leaving Australia, the Bee Gees had mailed demo tapes to prospective record companies, agents, and managers in London. Nobody was interested, except for Robert Stigwood, who at the time was partnered with the Beatles manager, Brian Epstein. Stigwood liked what he heard and summoned them to an audition. My gut instinct told me that they would be sensational because uh, you can't deny talent. And the talent it was so obvious. We go to the, to the Savile Theatre in, um, in London, and downstairs there's a like, lounge room and bar and stuff that they have in the theatres, and we set up down there. Robert came in and he's kind of looking a bit like Oscar Wilde. I've always felt to this day he was a little the worse for wear when he came down, but I'm being kind, Robert. <laughs> they claim I fell asleep, which is rubbish. He came in with his assistants and sat down said, okay, you know, sing, show me what you do. And we did our club act from a, even the Peter, Paul and Mary section we do. We didn't know how 
you know, we were, we were getting across to him. And um, then he was on a singer, we did about four or five songs. And, uh, and he had two people next to him, and he got up and he nodded to them, and they all walked out. And that was it. They came home and they were really heartbroken. They said it was just a waste of time. They got home about five o'clock in the afternoon. At half past eight, the phone rang and it was Robert. He said, bring them in tomorrow to sign the contracts. Just as quick as that, you know, and they didn't think he'd even heard them. Stigwood had heard them and immediately signed the brothers to a five-year contract. The link between Bob Stigwood and the Bee Gees was very close. And the relationship was just like that of Brian Epstein and the Beatles. For Bob Stigwood, the Bee Gees were his boys. And it was like a family almost. The things Robert loved them and he believed in them. Sometimes a bit of a complex relationship, but it certainly worked. He opened up the world to the Bee Gees very, very quickly. And I don't think at that particular time anyone else could have done that, that job. And uh, what we're, what's happening to us today is because of what he did then. Robert Stigwood sat there and said, you're going to do it, and I'm going to make sure you do it. And he never, ever made a, a negative comment about whether it might or might not work. This is where we're going, and that's it. In the event of something happening to me, there is something I would like you all to see. I was preparing to make their first album. I took them into a demo studio. And he said, can you, while you're here, it was one of the last nights, he says, would you just write one more song for me that you, that, that you, that you really believe in, you know? And uh, in those days, like, we used to write a song in 15 minutes, you know? They weren't necessarily good, but we wrote really fast. And um, we went out and sat on the steps because we had to get away from everybody else to do it. There was a power breakdown. So the three lads sat on the stairs in the dark. In the area where the cage is, where the elevator goes down and there's steps on either side. We just sat on the steps and Barry was playing his guitar. We were in pitch darkness. And so we were sitting, and the echo was fantastic, better than any of those toilets. And you had the whole echo of the elevator shaft and everything. So. It sounded great. I keep straining my ears to hear a sound. And the vision that came to us was the idea of being in a mine with no light. And how would that feel? Or have they given up and all gone home to bed? Thinking those who once existed must be dead. Have you seen my wife, Mr. Jones? To augment their sound and make themselves into a real band, the Bee Gees added two musician friends from Australia, Colin Peterson on drums and Vince Maloney on lead guitar. The new group recorded their first single and Stigwood mounted a bold publicity campaign, declaring them the most significant new musical talent of 1967. Whoa. Talking about us? You know, we were like, whoa, Barry, oh my God, that's something to live up to. This is how Stigwood wanted to launch the Bee Gees. And he didn't want to do it half-heartedly. He knew that he wanted to make an impact. And the only way by doing it is actually throwing down the gauntlet. And they were compared with the Beatles right from the word go, which really was a compliment. It was definitely the pressure we needed to inspire us. A lot of people would be overwhelmed by this kind of thing, but with us, that's what we, what we wanted. When New York mining disaster appeared in the spring of 1967, it really cut through almost everything else on the radio like just a beacon through a fog because it was a strong narrative mood building song. Have you seen my wife, Mr. Jones? It made people realize that there were some really good new storytellers in popular music. In less than six months, the Bee Gees had gone from unknowns at the Southampton docks to having top 20 hits on both sides of the Atlantic. They were instantly plunged into the hurricane 
of first fame. But at that point, just as our heads were about to explode, you know, uh, Robert sat us down and said, now I want you to listen to me. You haven't made it. You've got a hit record. Don't get it all out of proportion. When you've had five hit records, I'll say to you, you've made it. A key element of their success was the emotional depth of their sound. The Bee Gees had always been fans of soul music. Recognizing this, Sigwood arranged a meeting with a legendary soul artist. He introduced me to Otis Redding and we sat in the suite. We chatted for a while and, and Robert said, I want, I want you to write a song for Otis Redding. And I said, well, we'll certainly try, you know, we'd be delighted because we, you know, we, were, we were huge fans. Robert went out that night. He said, I'm leaving you alone tonight. When I come back, I want to hear an Otis Redding song. Oh, thanks, Rob. Yeah. I was young enough and ambitious enough that, of course, I'll do it right away, you know. To love somebody who was born that night. So I sang the body of that song to Robert when he came in. He said, thank you, that's what I want. And uh, when I got back to England, we finished the song together. Redding died before he could record to love somebody. So the brothers cut it themselves, turning it into one of their most beloved songs. Just before moving to England, Barry had married his Australian sweetheart, Maureen. But pop stardom changed everything, and they quickly drifted apart. I was one of those people who couldn't wait to get married. And that was me. I had to be loved, or I had to have a companion. We were in the studio morning, noon, and night. We were promoting Full Belt before we had a hit record. And so I, I hardly saw Maureen, and she hardly saw me. So within a year, the whole thing just fell apart. For Morris, those early heady days were one long holiday. He quickly fell into the swinging London scene, and before long, he was welcomed into the most exclusive circles of rock royalty. When you think that five months before all this was going on, I was in, a, in Pitt Street buying up a Beatle fan club book. And now here I am partying with these guys, my heroes. So the drink came more, the, the money became more. I'm only 19, 18, 19 years of age. You know, and after all the work we had done through clubs and everything, I felt grown up. I felt like I'd been through the mill. Robin began dating Molly Hollis, the receptionist in Sigwood's office. They would be married in late 1968. But not before Robin faced the most traumatic event of his life. Hither Green, less than 24 hours after the horror of the Caravelle crash. On November 5th, Robin and his girlfriend Molly were returning to London by train. Suddenly, the train came off the tracks. 49 people were killed, 78 seriously injured. There were just two of us in the compartment, and we went, ended up upside down, hearing people screaming. I got out of the window, walked along the side, and saw bodies everywhere. We were waiting for Robin to join us, and I stood up in the room, and I said, I think something's happened to Robin. I pulled people out of the wreckage. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing that when you're in a situation like that, you don't know your own strength. And I was bruised afterwards with a lot of them, lifting people up. Well, twice my weight. We found out where they were, where all the people were taken. Uh, the Green Hospital, and we drove straight there. And there amongst it all was Paul and Robin and Molly sort of sitting in the corner like this. You know. The hospital scene was absolutely horrifying. The scene of people with the kind of injuries that they had. It was literally like being World War II. 
think that it probably took things like the train disaster to bring out the pathos in Robin. It's been there ever since. Neil, I'm going back to Massachusetts. Something's telling me I must go home. I think once Massachusetts became the number one record in England, our first number one record, that was something. You can actually guess how you're going to feel when you get your first number one because it's something you've always wanted to have. It was kind of like a fulfillment of what we wanted to do. We left Australia. It was kind of a confirmation of our belief in ourselves. It's kind of like, yeah, we did the right thing. It was the first international number one, as in for any artist and their management. When you crack that, uh, it's a very special and emotional moment. I still think, I still choke when I think about it, you know? What I was so impressed with in terms of the Bee Gees is that the harmonies were incredible. Very, very unique, very distinctive. Almost to where the name Bee Gees was the adjective for what they were doing uh, from the minute they appeared on American radio. It's like it sounds like the Bee Gees. I don't know anybody who can sing harmony quite so naturally as they do. Uh, you know, get them in a room here and ask them to sing, and immediately you're assailed by perfect harmony. The Bee Gees' singular sound also features the presence of two distinct lead vocal styles. Barry's soulful, passionate delivery and Robin's ethereal vibrato. I started a joke Which started the whole world crying He's got a wonderful voice. It, makes, it still makes me go cold when I listen to him. I don't think there was any particular plan about who sang what. It's just where, where things fell, you know, where certain songs and styles worked at a certain frame of time. But certainly it was based on the style of the song more than who sang it. Well, who sang the leads has never been an issue. Robin's voice was so infectious at that point that it just, uh, those were the songs that he, that he automatically should be singing. I knew, you know, and Morris knew that um, that vibrato was killer, you know, and uh, the more we could use it, the better. a vulnerable instrument in a very forceful way. It could communicate a vulnerability but a lot of personal intensity at the same time because he had no competition whatsoever in pop music. There was no other voice like his. What could have seemed like a weakness became an incredible strength in the band. When it comes to the songs like Joke and, and Holiday, I mean, who do you, you know, I mean, that's the voice. That's the, the voice that reaches your heart. An undeniable strength of the Bee Gees has always been their songwriting. Like John Lennon and Paul McCartney, the brothers, sometimes working separately, sometimes together, were quickly proven to be prolific composers. Every time they would write something, they would play it to me. But I would analyze very carefully with them. And there were no holes, bad at all. Uh, just an open debate, which I would normally win. <laughs> I think there's an affinity between the Bee Gees and the Beatles, particularly with their early material, in the linking of very good hooks, very good melodies, which stick in the mind. And that, in itself, is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. You had to listen to these songs once they came on. You had to listen to them because they were very, very magnetic. And they cast a spell in a way that was very piercing in its personal directness. Barry 
Gregory had emerged as the sex symbol of the group. He was as irresistible to women as they were to him. I would always carry rings in my pocket so that I'd be able to say to that girl, I love you, here's the ring, you know? And it always led, it always led to bed. And, <laughs> and uh, that was just, that was just, uh, I was a rogue. Yes, I was a rogue, I admit it. <laughs> but once I saw Linda, there was only one ring. I met Linda at Top of the Pops. Linda was chosen to be the hostess the week that we were on, and the week that Massachusetts was number one. And uh, I saw her across the studio with a sash, I think that said Miss Edinburgh. And uh, I remember thinking, that, that girl is devastating. And uh, I'm going to be my usual self. I'm going to go I'm going straight over to that girl and do something about it. Shortly after meeting Linda, Barry and Robert Sigwood traveled to California on business, but business wasn't on Barry's mind. Right after checking into the Beverly Hills Hotel, Barry told Sigwood that he was going home. And he said, what? You, you can't go back to England, we've just arrived. We, we, there's things you have to do, there's, there's a whole schedule. And I said, but you don't understand. Well, maybe you do understand, Robert, that, that, I'm, that this is the girl, this is the one. I've got to go back, I've got to find her. I can vouch for the fact that love at first sight happens and most certainly happened to me. Ooh, you're a holiday. Barry wasn't the only BG falling in love. On December 12, 1968, with clamoring press and fans on hand, Robin and Molly married. A few months later, on February 17, 1969, in what was the pop wedding of the moment, Morris tied the knot with Lulu, one of England's brightest young stars. The Bee Gees' greatest strength had always been their unbreakable family bond. While on the surface, everything seemed wonderful, the truth was that success, love, and the trappings of fame were ripping the Bee Gees apart. I mean, there was a lot of money all of a sudden, and cars, and girlfriends, and, you know, things like that. The world was upside down. It just went wherever you were supposed to go, and people knew you, and people said hello and shook your hand, and you had no idea why, except that we made it, and whatever that is, you know. So our relationship with each other changed a bit, because we've been, we, we were not just kids living together, we've been kids living together with each other, right up until the time we arrived, and even after we arrived in England. Now we were becoming men, and we were having thoughts about what men do on their own rather than uh, as a unit. It's very difficult being successful in the rock and roll business. Stems are even more difficult to stay successful because the pressures are so great. You're always on demand, you're always at everyone's beck and call. You cannot escape the fame, which is a kind of prison for, for young people. We needed that capacity for separate lives where not everything was based on what the other did. The tendency always is to say, damn it, I'm a BG, I'd much rather be Barry, or I'd much rather be Robin, or, or much rather be Morris. Same with the Beatles, you know. They got sick and tired of being a Beatle. They wanted to be their own people, with their own recognition. So as you sort of start to hit the edge of fame, then a sort of entourage emerges for each one all giving advice, talking to them. When you're that young and, and you're having a lot too much too soon, you tend to sort of, you like to have praise, and praise is a wonderful thing when you're a teenager. It kind of makes you feel and do things, it kind of makes you feel superhuman, you know. Love interests were happening and jealousies were happening. You know, I call it um, just lack of maturity. To me, a lot of what happened in that breakup was due to too much happening too soon. What happened was drugs. Pilly, potting and pissy. You know, each one did different drugs or whatever, you know. Rod would take a few pills if I smoked a joint or if I had a drink. Mine was booze, all the way. We stopped knowing each other. We stopped feeling each other's feelings. And uh, that's another lesson, you know, that, that that's what drugs do. That's what, uh, that's what drink does. We lost contact with each other, me and Barry Morris didn't really 
talk as much as we used to, and therefore, we, you know, there was a kind of bickering going on. If Robin said something about me, the same reporter would come to me and say, did you know that Robin said that? And vice versa, you know. I don't think we were mature enough to stop it. I think we enjoyed publicity. So the press would thrive on it, and we thrived on it. So there's all these awful feelings. Conflict all around. But at least it's true, you know? At least no one else can say, oh, this is what happened. I'm telling you what happened, you know? It, it was, it was, all three of us became isolated. And, and all three of us did things to each other that I think we're all sorry. So, um, you know, that's the truth of the matter. Family groups have a really hard time, uh, as a rule. And in 1969, when the Bee Gees broke up, it was really a family circumstance that had done it. I think we were all as bad as each other. I, I don't think you can blame it on one person. I think we were all very um, selfish at that point. There's always been two very forceful personalities uh, in the Bee Gees, and that's Barry Gibb and, and Robin. Poor old Maurice was in the middle. He didn't know what was going on. Yes, it's the story of my life, really. <laughs> Morris found himself on both sides of the escalating battle, torn between the conflicting ambitions of Barry and Robin. And Robin, believing Sigwood was giving Barry more attention, became resentful. With the group about to release their fourth album, the atmosphere surrounding the brothers had become charged with suspicion and distrust. What really happened is 1st of May, the record was coming out and everybody sort of went for 1st of May as being the A-side and Barry was singing the lead on that. And on the other side it was Lamplight, which Robin wanted to sing in the lead. And so Robert chose 1st of May and thinking he was biased towards Barry, Robin said, ah, that's it, I've had it. Because he thought it was done on purpose. A lot of things had gone down at that time and we needed time apart to think about. And that was one of those moments that we had to realise we've got to be apart for a while. But not that we wanted to but it just had to be. Robin quit the group and started work on a solo album. He and Molly became isolated from the family. Disturbed by his erratic behavior, Hugh and Barbara tried to make 19-year-old Robin a ward of the court. It was kind of a whole strange episode in our lives, that particular. It, it didn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense now, but it, it, it happened. And it was kind of a weird feeling all the time it was happening. Robin's very first solo single, Saved by the Bell rose to number two on the British charts. Barry and Morris continuing as the Bee Gees made Don't Forget to Remember, which also went to number two. Amidst all the turmoil, the two remaining Bee Gees filmed a comedy special for television. Yes, pure so in it. Um, I think it was good that we did Cucumber Castle. That doesn't mean I think the Cucumber Castle was good. My Cucumber and I welcome you to Cucumber Castle. I just think it was good that we did something really silly. Oh, for my boring brother, the King. And something that was fun. Uh, well, hello there. Hi, who are we having for dinner? <laughs> you. Uh, Anything to escape oh, that whole era of drugs and, 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 um, and to grow up finally. Although, from watching Cucumber Castle, I don't think we grew up at that very point. In the event of something happening to me. That was to come. By early 1970, the Bee Gees had stopped working together and embarked on a series of solo projects. I would never have guessed at that point, however, that the Bee Gees would come back together again. It didn't feel like that was ever going to happen. I knew they would get back together eventually. I mean, blood's thicker than water. They were brothers. The time we spent apart was basically a rough time for the three of us emotionally because although we, we separated as a group, I don't think we really meant they wanted to. We miss each other so desperately musically and as brothers, you know, we're brothers. And it couldn't go on, even if we weren't a group anymore, we couldn't go on not speaking to each other all our lives. After months of trying to figure out the best way to breach the gulf between them, the brothers were finally ready to come together as the Bee Gees. When the three of them made the piece, I said, let's go into the studio right away. It was a little nervous working together again. 
The first things we cut was uh, How Can You Mend a Broken Heart, which was written in the afternoon, and Lonely Days that night, and two number one records, which we had no idea there would be. Lonely Days was an instrumental I was playing the opening thing on the piano, and Barry and Robbie came around and we started singing it before we knew what the song was taking shape. We were like, it was like fresh. It was the energy that each one had on expressing what they'd learned by being apart. It all came out in that, in that week. And uh, it was brilliant. It was a wonderful session. We came back as men, so we'd always been boys growing up together and brothers before. And I think we came back together as three, three guys where we respected each other's space and interests and opinions. If anything, that was the good thing that came out of it. It took two, three years to heal. There was a, a real serious estrangement there because it's hard to grow up under any circumstances and to admit the fact that you're never going to be distant from your family, that you need your family. You know, all of us have to leave home at some point. And the Bee Gees, in a way, found they couldn't leave home. They had to find some adult way of going back and making peace with the past. In writing about the problems they faced as brothers, they had created music that was deeply felt. Singing about separation and reconciliation, about love lost and found, in essence, telling their own story, they reconnected with their audience. Um, wonderful title. Um, 
Uh, I don't think it was a very good album. It was an awful album. Oh yeah, I mean your ego's deflated enormously. You know, but that was meant to be too. I mean, it was it wasn't good stuff. The confrontation was painful because they put their hearts in it. They weren't being lazy. They were just a little bit off track. In search of a more contemporary sound, their manager, Robert Stigwood, paired them with legendary R&B producer, Arif Martin. the Mr. Natural album did not crack the top 100. It was, however, an important transition as it reawakened their passion for soul music. This difficult period, Barry and Robin became fathers for the first time. But Morris's marriage to Lulu was crumbling. And when you spend six years of your life with somebody, it's like really weird all of a sudden you're driving around in your car with your bags in it and the dog on the front seat. You know, it's like very strange. So naturally, I turned to more drinking. In late 1974, the Bee Gees began performing on the British nightclub circuit. One of the venues they played was Batley's Variety Club where Morris met Yvonne Spensley. I just saw her eyes, and I said, I'm going to marry her. I think what came across more than anything was the warmth that he had. I thought, oh, what a really sweet guy he seems to be, you know? And I think that's what came across more than anything else, apart from him being talented, of course. I think that attracted me to him, and it was really cute. <laughs> Besides the innocence, I saw a lot of strength. She's very compassionate. He's very romantic. Very sweet. Oh, definitely, without question, the best thing I've ever done is marry Yvonne. Without a doubt. As 1974 gave way to 1975, the Bee Gees were ready for a new beginning. Their old friend, Eric Clapton, then on the verge of a comeback of his own, suggested that the brothers try Miami's Criteria Studios. With Arif Martin again producing, they started recording a new album. We were on our way back from the studio, and every time you leave Criteria, there's a bridge. And the bridge is rickety, and it makes a noise when you go over it. And every night, I hear the same thing. That I'd hear it every night. So one night, uh, went over there, and the car must have been traveling at a certain speed, and the rhythm felt really right. And I just started singing along with it. And it just became, you know, I don't know where the term jive talking came from, that just sort of popped into my head. As is what usually happens if I have an idea of a song. It's not something I ask for, it just comes. And I, this was something. And I thought, wait, I gotta sing this tomorrow's note when I get home. I sang the idea to them. And we actually wrote the entire song that night. Well, we played it to a reef, and he went, do you know what joy talking means? And we said, well, yes, you know, you're dancing. He says, no. <laughs> I'm putting on this Turkish accent, you see, because this is how he talks. <laughs> and he said, uh, no, it's, it's a black expression for bullshitting. <laughs> and we went, oh, really? Joy talking, you're telling me lies. <laughs> but he gave us the groove, the tempo, everything. When I first heard Jive talking, I had no idea of the BGS. Everybody went, who? 
The Bee Gees broken heart, Bee Gees? Are you kidding?